do I like how much guys have to move the ball? I, I don't know. I guess what the old school part of me, no. But that doesn't matter, like, because what's getting strikes and what's, you know, gaining runs, receiving – uh, our techniques that are moving the ball more. Welcome to the first episode of the Backpick Podcast, the newest edition of our network. I'm your host, Brett Thomas. I am so fired up to bring you guys so much good information from some great guests, helping you become a better player, a better coach, and even a better parent of a player. We sat down with Tony Arnrich, a huge influence in my life, now a hitting coach with the Seattle Mariners. Tony was a catching coordinator, has caught his whole life. We had a, such a deep dive into some great information on our receiving techniques. We talked about pitch calling. We talked about relationships with umpires. We talked about the processes these guys go through. We even took a little bit of a dive into youth baseball, him now having a 10-year-old son. I'm super excited about it. Hope you guys enjoy it. this um I always kind of knew I wanted to coach when I was growing up playing um I think you definitely took it to another level for me in terms of catching right and like really get a more of a deep dive everything I had been taught to that point was very basic and you know you brought a whole other level to it and uh really kind of brought out a little more of my passion for catching and I think that's one of the coolest parts about what we can do as coaches, instructors, teachers, is there's like more in kids, players, athletes in general, in terms of their actual passions and desires, when you give them a little bit more information. And uh, I guess just a thank you to start for that, for what you've done, your big part of what the Catch Academy has become. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I think it's everybody has their guys that they've been influenced by. And for me, it was, you know, Tim Cousins from the Orioles. And uh, I call him my mentor. And he's like, what? I how am I your mentor? What are you talking about? Like, and it's like, no, you taught me so much about the position and his passion for the position. Um, you can see it in a lot of catchers too. And I knew with you right away, it was like, okay, like you have that, that extra passion for the position and, and appreciation for the position. And so, um, obviously coaching players that are bought in and want to, want to get better and want to learn is probably the best thing about coaching. You know, you can just dive in and, and get going. So, um, Thank you for always, you know, being open for that and uh, wanting to learn and then teaching me on the flip side as well. For sure. Interesting point to start there. Talk a little bit about your relationship with Cuz. Um, I know you go back to like when you were growing up working with Cuz. Yeah. Well, so my dad ran a sporting goods store and Cuz uh, started working for him. And my dad kept finding a Cuz in the, the glove section. <laughs> And specifically the catcher's gloves. And so my dad made him the glove expert because uh, he knew he was going to be hanging out there all day anyway. So he's like, okay, you're just in charge of the gloves. And so uh, that's kind of where it started. And my dad recognized early that Tim was a very talented catcher. Um, and from a, a young age, I just gravitated to the position and loved it. The gear, the dirt, the, you know, everything about it was, was just right up my alley being the uh, – the fourth kid of six and the, you know, having two older brothers, it was just kind of like, you know, I had that fire and, um, Tim right away, my dad sent me, he's like, just go work out with this guy. Like, just go hang out with him, do what he tells you. And how, how old was he? Or where was he playing at the time? He was playing at Santa Rosa JC. Okay. Um, and, and I, I mean, I guess I was, you know, 10 years younger than he and, and, uh, he would just bring me in and let me work out with him. And then that continued when he went to University of Oklahoma. He played professionally. He'd come home in the off seasons and I'd, I'd work out with him. Um, you know, he just really was welcoming and and wanted to give to me as much as I was willing to take. And, and so from a young age, I was exposed to pretty advanced, I guess, uh, at that, that time, pretty advanced catching um, techniques or, or theories or whatever you want to call it. Uh, he... He exposed me to a lot of it at an early age, which I think really helped me um, dive into the position and kind of question and not not necessarily question, but explore um, the position and, and things that we can do in the position. And obviously, I feel like I learned so much growing up, but but then the, the position changed so much uh, as I got older. But he, he always was evolving with the with the game and with uh, where it was at. And he's always taught me like, you know, there's always got to be 
more to learn and better ways to do things and more efficient ways, I guess I should say, not necessarily better, but, uh, but being open to those and exploring those, I think being exposed to him at a young age really helped me kind of, uh, formulate my, uh, philosophy or my, my, my drive and what, what I look for and what I want to do with this position and, and continue to learn it and continue to help people, uh, get better at it, I guess. It's funny, I always think back to when I was at Cal playing for you and we'd have those times we'd be in the cage and off season and and Cuz would be there and and John Baker from at the time was with the Marlins would be there. And uh, at the time, you know, obviously things have advanced and, you know, you see what people really are capable of. But it's like we knew there was a big league, you know, a major league catching coordinator there. And then obviously Bake was in the big leagues. You were obviously fantastic. And then you go look back and I'm like, man, I got a chance to work with those three guys like all the time, catch two eventual catching coordinators. You're now on a big league staff. You know, Bake's running, you know, all the development for the Pirates. I mean, how lucky were we at that point in time to have you guys and, and just be banging around in the cage was unbelievable. Yeah, and I think it's funny. We always talk about the uh, – I don't like to call it a click, but there's just a catching, uh, you know, area that, that you get a bunch of catchers around each other and they could talk forever about the position, about – experiences and I think part of that is why catchers make good managers they're just very uh you know open to talking they they, they're passionate about the game they're passionate about the position and and so you get three guys like that together with a guy like yourself and a guy like Andrew Knapp who uh ends up playing in the big leagues and I mean you can start rapping pretty good about a lot of you know uh theories and, and thoughts about the position and and baseball in general and uh, I just call it kind of the catching click, right? If it and it's funny, you get catchers from all over the country, or former catchers or catching coaches, and you start talking, and and you find yourself talking for an hour, and you're like, "What the heck just happened?" Right? Uh, it's it's such a um, there's an appreciation, I think, for the position that that a lot of us have, and um, we just want to continue to learn from each other, which is really cool. And I, I, you know, the hitting world's a totally different area, but in the catching world, it just seems like um, there's there's not a lot of ego involved when you when you talk to guys like Cuz when you talk to guys like Bake when you talk to guys like yourself it's like okay what what do I know and what can I bring to the table but like what does that guy know that I can maybe learn from and and you feel that mutual uh, respect and that mutual uh, yearning for like okay you teach me something too because you know I, I feel like I can learn so much from other people as well and I think that's just contagious and the people that we were exposed to really helped us i think uh become the people we are now because of the way they were it's like okay like this this works this guy knows his shit and yet he's still learning and he's still asking questions and he's asking questions from somebody who maybe played in the big league or somebody that just has a passion for the position and um so that respect factor i think from an early age was something that that i learned from cuz and then we were very fortunate to have bacon there as well i mean what what a great dude and um when you get people like that around it's just it's really fun to continue to go and work and, and explore, I guess. For sure, for sure. So you kind of followed in Cuz's footsteps going to Santa Rosa Junior College. And this is it's funny because I was like doing some research, just Googling your name and thinking about some stuff to talk about today. And I don't think I ever really have heard much about your time at Texas Tech. Talk a little bit about the experience down there. It was interesting. Uh, you know, in the fall, I, I, I was born with a heart condition. So in the fall, I wasn't able to practice. Um, and they were, they were actually – telling me I wasn't gonna be able to play baseball basically ever again. Um, and so there was a lot of work uh, that had, I had to go through with our doc, my doctors back home to get me cleared to even play for the spring. Uh, so the fall was very challenging for me. Um, and and I felt like the game was being taken away from me a little bit. Uh, and, and, you know, they were looking out for my best interest. So it wasn't by any means, uh, I didn't understand it. But uh, my doctors back home luckily had been following me for my whole life and they they uh, vouched for me and so I was able to play in the spring. But I needless to say I missed the whole fall, which was tough. Uh, w- when you talk about trying to learn a staff and and uh, be a teammate and you're not allowed to practice uh, and you're kind of doing your own thing for the whole fall, that was um, a challenge for me. But I think one thing that really helped me was we had uh, I think three other guys from Santa Rosa JC that had transferred to Texas Tech um, and. The city's awesome. I mean, everything there revolves around the, the university. It's in the middle of nowhere. Um, you can literally see it in your rear view for about seven hours when you drive out in Lubbock because <laughs> it's so flat. Uh, 
but it's windy. But it's just there's the, the people there are passionate about the sports. Which when I visited there and they said, hey, we're gonna have this this stadium's gonna be packed every weekend that we're at home. I said, where do I sign up? Um, I wanted to play in the College World Series. We didn't quite get there. We 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 made it to a regional, um, but it was an amazing experience um, that I'll I'll never forget. That's for sure. Was Bob Knight there at the time? He got hired while I was there, uh, okay. and he threw out the first pitch at uh, one of our games. Uh, funny story. I, hopefully, I don't take up too much time, but um, he, he throws the first pitch out to me. I run the ball out to him, and I go to hand him the ball. He's like, I want you to keep the ball. And I said, well, will you sign it? He said, yeah, I'll sign it. He's like, uh, and so national anthem happens, and then all of a sudden, Bobby Knight's gone. And I'm like, well, he said he would sign it. Well, where is he? So I go by his office, and um, I leave the ball with his – his secretary she's like okay we'll have him sign it and so the season ends and i don't end up going by there and i'm thinking okay i'll never see this ball again i read a book about him and not that i agree with everything he does but he is a uh, you know he talks about being a man of his word and so um i go by i go by his office before i leave for summer ball and i ask his secretary like hey you know he said he's gonna give me this ball she's like did he say he was gonna get you that ball and i said yeah she said, then he will get you that ball. I promise. You don't need to keep coming back here and asking about it. So I'm like, okay. So I go off and play summer ball in the Northwoods League. And then I end up signing with the Royals out of out of the Northwoods League, which I didn't expect. But, it, uh, you know, opportunity came and I signed. And uh, so I just assumed I'll never see that baseball again. But when I drove back through or went back to Lubbock to pick up my stuff because I had signed, um, our head coach there, Larry Hayes, when I said goodbye to him, he's like, hey, uh, Coach Knight dropped this off last week for you. Uh, and it really just showed, like, okay, okay, that guy is a man of his word. And, so cool. And it uh, made me realize I was annoying his, his secretary. And, <laughs> but it, it confirmed that he was a man of his word and not that he did everything right, but uh, it was something that I respected. It's awesome. Yeah. We'll obviously dive into a little bit of catching stuff. It's obviously what our main focus is here. But uh, tell me a little bit about the season. Your first year on the big league staff, you go to the playoffs, you know, for the first time in, in 21 years, the Mariners go to the playoffs, end up winning the wild card series, get to move on. Talk about the experience. Talk about the guys. And obviously there seemed to be, at least based on the dancing going on, some pretty good chemistry on the squad. Yeah, I mean, it, it's just a fun group to be around. You know, you go to the park every day and um, it's just fun. Everyone you see is is uh, their own person. Their personalities come out. One of the things that uh, – our head, our skip talked about was, uh, you know, play with your personality. And when our guys started to realize, like, let's just play loose, let's have fun and play with our personality, um, they they found the best version of themselves and 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 really succeeded. And having a guy like Julio, with the energy he brings every day, and then having the leadership of Carlos Santana and and uh, Suar, Gino Suarez, and then you have a guy like JP at shortstop who just posts every day. Man, the guy comes to play every day and competes as his butt off every day, um, you know, and then Cal Raleigh coming into himself throughout the season. And, you know, but there was a lot of things that we did have to deal with. We, we weren't going well in, in uh, you know, in April and May. We, we struggled. And I think having some guys that came in, uh, you know, Justin Upton and um, some older guys that, that helped us kind of right the ship and, and our guys kind of figuring out who they were and how we were going to play. And uh, it, it all happened and, and we put it together and obviously having a good pitching staff helps uh, and having a good bullpen helps and uh, we started playing well and, and we went on that run when we won 14 straight which was just amazing um, but there, I think the biggest thing that my takeaway is just the, the care factor and the personalities and the people in our clubhouse and the, the players that we have and the people that they are um, really kind of just was what shined for me is, is you, you enjoyed going to the park every day it's pretty awesome. So talk a little bit about Scott Service, the the head the manager there, um, obviously caught in the big leagues. Mm -hmm. So you get hired, I guess, a couple of years ago as the catching coordinator. And, you know, the guy running the show is a former big league catcher. We know that the position has changed quite a bit. How was that kind of initial conversations of sitting down, talking about what you're doing, kind of what's new, what's changing compared to a guy who'd done it for a long time in the big leagues? Yeah, I think the, the biggest thing, first off, was just, I want to learn from him, right? Uh, there's a catching in the big leagues for 162 game season. Uh, obviously, you're not catching every day, but there's there's more that goes into that than people probably realize. Um, and so, just learning from him at the start was a big thing. Like, just hey, tell me some things that I need to know uh, that I didn't get to know because I didn't I didn't you know catch in the big leagues. Um, 
And so learning from him at the beginning was was probably the the main focus. And then just he made it easy from the start of he was very open and, and wanting to talk about things and wanting to um, he had no problem saying like, well, I don't know about that. Like, tell me why or um, tell me, you know, what your thoughts are on this. And um, him being open at the beginning and 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 wanting to kind of explore uh, made it easy for me. And, uh, and then our one of our other coaches, Carson Vitale. Uh, is a catching guy as well. And so just having us three there uh, chatting about it and then, um, but his willingness and, and, and I guess desire to continue to learn and continue to bring his opinion and, and, and tell me what he was thinking about it actually helped uh, form a lot of my opinion as, as well. So it was all from the start, just kind of a, a, a learning process. And um, it's definitely made me a better coach being around him just because his experiences are invaluable and, and what he can pr- provide and um, his his viewpoints on things really um, help bring mine to another level, that's for sure. Love that. I mean, having three catching guys essentially on one staff, that's pretty awesome. It's fun. I mean, and it, it's, uh, you know, catching at the big leagues is, is such a, a different animal, I guess. Uh, there's so much that goes into – you have to be prepared to play every night. Um, uh, is there development? Absolutely. Like you're going to continue to hopefully get better, but you may just be wanting to get your body right to be able to pre- catch that night. And so understanding all that goes into it, you know, the the travel and uh, us being in Seattle, the travel that we have is, is pretty intense. Um, and so there's a lot that goes into it that maybe people don't see what, you know, about managing your body, managing uh, your mental health, managing uh, the the opponent you're playing and managing the staff that you have and then you also have to hit <laughs> you know it's a um it's a daunting task and i think part of it is just learning how to manage all those different things um that i think having three guys there really helps uh to to not miss anything and to make sure that we are kind of not drifting away from things that we believe in um and and also understanding the most important thing is that our guy has to be able to go out and play that night and our players have to be able to go out and perform that night. And what is it going to take to, to manage their day? How do they manage their day to allow them to come to the park every day and be able to physically and mentally play a very tough game? And a lot of guys have to focus on the mental, I mean, everybody, but and have to prepare for the opponent, but not quite like the catcher. Mm-hmm. How does that equation come in where you're like, okay, he might do his you know workout routine in the morning to get his body right. How much of the preparation goes into their own personal mental prep and then obviously the studying of the opponent and running through the game plan? Yeah, I think as the season goes on, it becomes more clear uh, and your day becomes more, um, I guess, uh, similar each day, right? You, you start to find your, your routine. and uh, But I, I do think part of it is us trying to give them the information they need without them having to go search for it too much, right? Like, so what do, what do they need? What do they like? Who's pitching that night for us? What is he like? Um, and giving them that information so they're not spending too much time um, trying to find information. It's like, what do you need? Here's what we have for you. We're going to get you what you need so that we don't waste time or they don't waste time diving into things that maybe we don't need them to if we already have the info. Uh, but, but I think it's um, one of those things that the more you play, play people, you get to understand them. And the more you catch your your pitchers, the better you understand them. And so that's just an evolving process throughout the whole season of, okay, what is this guy net like? What does he need? How do, how can me as a catcher provide that for my pitcher? Um, and then also understand that you need to make time for yourself uh, getting ready to hit and uh, uh, getting ready to perform You know your, your part on defense as well that night. With the – kind of implement, implementing of like the earpiece in catcher's helmets, things like that. Do you foresee the, the pitch calling being taken away from catchers at some point? I don't know. I, I, no, I don't. No. Um, I mean, I could see someone maybe trying it. Um, I remember, I forget who it was. Someone was telling me, you know why coaches don't call pitches in the big leagues is because they don't want to be wrong. Right. And, and, uh, they, they don't want to be the guy that they say, why'd you throw that pitch, right? And uh, it's such a unique and uh, nuanced thing, calling pitches. Um, and I think it's evolving a lot uh, to where you're trying to throw your best pitches the most. Um, 
our our pitching coordinator Max Weiner made a good point. He said, "Tony, I want you to imagine you're playing MLB the Show, and you have a pitcher on the mound, and he has he has four pitches. You don't know what they are, but they're ranked best pitch, second best pitch, third best pitch, fourth best pitch." He said, "What pitch are you going to throw the most?" I said, "The best pitch." He goes, "What if I told you the best pitch was his slider?" And I'd say, "Well." And I probably would throw a slider more. And and it went, once I heard that analogy about pitch calling, I'm like, this makes a lot of sense. Like, why would you not want to throw your best pitch more often? And um, so that's kind of where my mind started evolving on the pitch calling side of like, hey, you know, establishing the fastball is important. Yeah, sure. But if this guy's fastball is his third best pitch and he doesn't have the ability to command it, not that he shouldn't be able to, but like, let's continue to work at that and try to develop the ability to do that. But also, don't uh, lose a game because you're trying to establish a fastball when you have a wipeout slider. And um, someone that comes to mind that you know uh, is Tyson Ross. You know, in, when he was at Cal, he threw a ton of sliders. And mm -hmm. I remember people, you know, scouts and everyone question, why, why, do they, why do they call so many sliders for him? And it's like, it's a because it's pitch. an elite pitch. <laughs> yeah, like, and, and people, you know, were worried about him getting injured and, um, I, you know, Tyson, he has a unique delivery and, um, I just remember every time someone tried to change his delivery, he'd get hurt. And every time he throw the way he throws, he wouldn't get hurt. And, um, and he threw a lot of sliders and that's just what he did. And, um, but I think the pitch calling thing is, is evolving and it's, um, we're learning more about, you know, the right pitches to call and, and not even so much about the right pitches to call, but what pitches you probably shouldn't be calling in certain situations. Like understanding that as well is just as important. If you can throw less pitches that you shouldn't be throwing and you throw more pitches that you should be throwing, you're probably going to have more success. And so um, there's a lot that goes into it, but managing that is definitely something that our guys have to do. And the earpieces, I think, it was pretty seamless. At the, you know, there's been some issues with it, you know, whether it worked or not. But um, I think our guys at the end of the day liked it. Um, and he took away sign stealing. So, um on defense, that's nice. For sure. For sure. It's interesting, too, how it, everything's moved vertically, right? Obviously, velocity has gone up a lot, but just pitching up and pitching up in the zone. Mm -hmm. Because realistically, like 10 years ago, it felt like you were throwing everything down and you try to maybe finish a guy up. And it wasn't even really like pitching in the zone as much as just, you know, try to get him to chase something up. Yeah. How much, um, you know, and obviously I know, you know, you've kind of more evolved to hitters now than catchers. So maybe as a as a staff, how much do you guys focus on the development of receiving the pitch up now where we used to spend so much time getting below that ball down? Now you got to be able to catch something 98 above the zone and, and move that back into the zone. Yeah, more a lot more, to be honest. Um, it's been something something that we talked about in Carson, um, you know, really harped on our guys about being able to pitch or receive the high pitch well. And I think that just goes back to understanding your pitcher as well. If he is a guy that pitches up in the zone, you got to figure out the right way to uh, target the right pre-pitch movement you're going to need to be able to um, to manipulate that pitch in, in a way that you'd like to. Um, and, and it's really a hard pitch to, uh, to steal a strike, I guess, would be the best way to put it, uh, just because it's right in front of the umpire's face. Uh, he gets a pretty good look at it. So... It's it's something that we've definitely dove into more uh, because guys are throwing up in the in the zone more. It's more of a, a vertical strike zone and less lateral. Uh, so you have to be able to not be a mess on the pitch up. I guess would be the best way to put it. Like let's keep strike strikes, and if we end up getting more above, cool. But like let's just make sure that we aren't losing strikes that should be called strikes at the top. For sure, and it's obviously a lot of movement now. Like catchers moving the ball a bunch, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, at some point, where do you get to the point where there's too much or not enough? And I think this conversation always comes up. I mean, obviously, I think within the circle, everybody's got an understanding of what it is. But when you kind of look at the casual person watching a game and go, man, the catcher's moving so much. Is there a point where you're like, that's too much? And is there a point where it's like, hey, we got to pick it up? I, I think it just depends. Um, I guess the answer is yes. I mean, I think there is a point where it's too much. I mean, the the generation that I came up in it was all about stick it like do not move the ball and so evolving to be able to try and teach that was was a process for me because it, you watch guys move the ball and you're like how is he moving that much and how are they calling it a strike and once umpires were started getting graded um you know it's when it kind of took off and once we were able to measure receiving is when it took off and 
Um, do I like how much guys have to move the ball? I, I don't know. I guess what the old school part of me, no. But that doesn't matter, like, because what's getting strikes and what's, you know, gaining runs, receiving, uh, are techniques that are moving the ball more. Um, now it's about efficiency, and it's about. I think the best guys, they move the ball a ton, and you don't even realize they're moving it a ton, and that's a unique ability. Uh, I think Austin Nola, uh, you know, Cal Raleigh, I think does a really good job of it. Just where they look like they're keeping it semi close to where they've received it. But then you look at it in slow-mo and they've moved it a pretty good amount. And so I think it's just trial and error and understanding, uh, you know, angles and efficiency. Cause a lot of times you move it too much because you aren't efficient and the ball is actually kind of moving your glove. And so it becomes a two piece move. And of course that's way too much movement. So how can you be efficient enough to where it doesn't look like you're moving a lot, but in reality you are. And really where the umpire doesn't really know how much you're moving it because that one piece move kind of all blends together if you're doing it consistently. Yeah, and the guys that do it well, like I I mean, I feel sorry for umpires. It's not easy, obviously. Um, it's something that uh, I guess the catching world has taken advantage of is like I, we, can, we can trick them, um, for lack of a better way to describe it. We can trick the human behind us. And, um, you know, when you get into high school baseball and you – you have a CPA who's umping baseball games for, you know, like because he loves baseball. Like you can trick that guy. And I'm not saying it's right or wrong or, or that I love it uh, or, or that it's, you know, whatever. But it is part of the game and, and it's something that has evolved and something that uh, has presented itself more, obviously, in the last 10 years. And it's it's one of those things where you you kind of evolve with it or, or you probably get passed by. It's the job of the catcher to make it difficult for the umpire, right? And it's like, you know, there's so many calls. I, th I think of basketball, right? And, and like, refereeing a basketball game is insanely difficult. Like, you've got these incredibly fast athletic dudes. One guy's jumping up to go. The other guy's jumping up to contest, and it's happening so fast, right? And almost all of the calls in basketball are that way, right? There's not really, like, easy calls in basketball. In baseball, there's easy calls, right? And now, like, I think even, obviously not like it was easier back then to call balls and strikes. Um, it's just the idea that now you have more velocity and you've got some better movers behind the plate that make it more difficult. So you kind of get that collision of the LeBron going up for the layup and KD's jumping up with him to defend him. And you're like, man, honestly, that happened so fast, I don't know. And that's part of the, the whole deal, right, is to make that difficult for the umpires in that situation. Yeah, and I think... Um you know, you, you talk about basketball, I mean, it, it happens fast. And now you talk about baseball, and the guys are throwing 100 miles per hour. Like you said, the stuff's coming in harder. Um, it has it has more movement, maybe. Um, but understanding those angles and, and knowing where you can be more efficient, that's why it's so important. Because you're trying to trick a human being, essentially. And again, I don't like that term, but it's it's really what's happening. And and so the more efficient you can be, the, the better. And understanding you know, your setup and the angle of your setup and what the pitch shape is doing and where do I let it travel to and what, where am I moving it to and where's this umpire's eye, uh, um, uh, line of sight and how do I manipulate that? Like there's so many things that go into it. But at the end of the day too, it's just about keeping strikes, strikes. And, and if you gain more out of that, cool, but like let's keep strikes, strikes and, and work out from there. I think that's another thing where even though we're, we're making the move and, you know, there is more movement to it, it's not really – we obviously get some pitches that are outside of the zone, but it's still that movement that allows us to just get the borderline pitches that are strikes and keep them strikes. And I think there's like a, a bad narrative on the idea that catchers are really trying to steal a lot of strikes as much as just trying to show consistency and really think – like I tell all the guys, like, you know, if you see that K zone on TV, it's like if the ball were to just barely touch that thing – are we working that thing back to the middle and get that for a strike? I don't care about the one four, six inches off the plate. If he's obviously going to give it to you, sit out there and take it. But it is just the idea of creating more efficient, fluid movements that even keep the really freaking good pitches in the zone strikes because our pitchers make really good pitches in the zone that we don't get a lot of the time. Yeah, I think that's a good way to put it is like, can we make it easy on the umpire to call strike strikes? Like, that, that's really what it comes down to. Like, can I make it easy that this guy knows every strike is a strike? And then from there, 
can we just cut on the edges a little bit and maybe we extend it out a quarter of an inch? You or, earn it a little yeah, later, you, right? Yeah, you You've done a good it. job. You set up a little further out and you make the same move. Or, yeah, you know. yeah. And I mean, this could all be going away soon. I mean, you see in AAA with the, the automated umpire. So it's just a, a, a classic case of the game evolving. And so right now, this is what plays. Do you love it or hate it? It really doesn't matter, right? My opinion of whether it looks good or it's aesthetically pleasing or not like doesn't matter it, it's what is winning baseball games when you talk about winning a base major league baseball game that's really hard to do and if you can find an edge uh you better believe people are going to take it and so this that's all people are doing is they're 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 trying to find a little edge here that can help them win a game and when you find those edges and you're at a level no matter what level you're at but baseball there's so much um it's a small margin for error. And so when you can find an edge here and there, it, it's going to help you win baseball games. And that's what we're in the, the business of doing is winning baseball games. Yeah, oh, that's totally. And that's a good point for, you know, at the younger levels, you know, you can you can kind of see a big mistake or something and what it might lead to. But they don't understand the, the little things that really do equate to wins and losses. And it's obviously nice in the big leagues you have, you know, so many stats that that give you a lot of those ideas, but if they can understand those nuances and what actually makes it, you know, has a direct effect on winning and losing, it's so important. And it's always finding that edge. And how much do you talk or do, does, you know, Carson or, or, or service talk about the relationship with the umpire and that coming into play with that as well? Well, it's something that we talked, we've talked about a lot in our org, uh, just coming up of understanding that not that you're trying to, um, trick them into liking you and then give you more calls but understanding what works for him tim cousins always said find out what music that guy plays and then play that music for him so what he meant was if this guy likes country music and let's just equate country music to moving the ball more he likes when you move it more he calls more strikes play his music man but he he maybe he does he likes classical and you're playing country and you're moving it a ton. And he's like, I don't like that. Like, okay, figure out what he likes. Maybe I move it less. Maybe I move it a different way. Maybe I go, you know, flexion to extension instead of extension to flexion, whatever it may be. But you find out what music they like. And, and I always talk about find something else, you know, football, uh, basketball. Do they have a, a favorite NFL team? Like, and I think over time you learn these guys and you get to know them because you have them throughout the minor leagues and, and coming up. But, but it is something that we talk about. Like, it, it's a relationship that, A, you want to have respect uh, for the guy that's behind you, um, and you want you want to respect him. I guess is the best better way to put it. You want to respect him, um, and and the best way to do that is to get to know him. Uh, and so you know, say hi and be respectful and learn learn what he likes uh, as far as calling pitches and try to play that music as much as you can. It's pretty sad at the lower levels what's going on with umpires right now. And it's like funny you say that because you're like you know hey obviously give him respect and you know he's going to respect you and you guys are going to have a relationship where you'll get something you know out of it if you're doing the right things and it's just so it's the constant berating now at younger levels i mean it's it's insane literally there's dads or like assistant coaches that are umpiring like jv baseball games because there's not enough umpires and the reality is like obviously you know it doesn't pay a whole lot but there was it didn't pay a whole lot back in the day either and there was never an issue finding umpires. It's just that these guys are like, I'm coming out here to, you know, glorified volunteer, make a little extra cash, mm -hmm. and I'm getting berated by people. I mean, with no basis of a relationship and just getting absolutely berated, why would anybody do it? Yeah, and, and I mean, it's your best question ever. Like, why would I sign up to do that? Totally. Um, and it's it, youth sports, it really, it's an interesting world right now that we're seeing, um, and... I think it just has gotten to a point where uh, money plays, and so and, and people want their kids to be major league baseball players, which I totally get. Being a major league baseball player is really hard. You're competing against everybody around the world, from uh, the DR to Venezuela to uh, Japan. I mean, there's players from all over the world, um, and understanding that I think is important as a parent. Like, look, I'm just gonna enjoy my son playing the game. Now, if an umpire misses a call, he misses a call. Like, that happens. Um, one of the best things I've heard is, I, you know, I'm not going to go uh, to to somebody that's running a golf course and, and say, hey, you don't mow your greens, right? Like, you're, you're mowing them like crap. Like, they're going to be like, who the heck are you? Like, this guy is out here pretty much volunteering his time, maybe making a couple bucks. Um, 
And I think it's important just as parents that we understand, uh, A, most of our sons are not going to play Major League Baseball. And that's okay. Like, baseball is a beautiful game. And I have friends that play in 50-year over leagues, right? Like, they love the game, and that's awesome. Um, but just understanding that, you know, what are, what are your motives as a parent and understanding that uh, we're constantly on display for our kids. So the more that I'm yelling at an umpire, I don't, what am I teaching my kid? What am I teaching my kid's friends? What am I, what am I teaching my team? Um, if I'm the coach of that team and, or even just a parent on that team. And, um, it's definitely concerning, you know, coming from somebody, I have a nine year old, almost 10 year old son. And, you know, you see a lot of it where it's like, man, they're just putting energy into things that don't matter. Mm -hmm. Um, let's, let's use that energy towards, um, be more passionate about the game and, and playing the game. And yeah, winning's important. I'm not saying it's not, uh, but there's a line I think that, that we need to make sure we don't cross. And, and I think just channeling your energy towards positive things. It's the one thing that I've, I do think can improve, especially at the youth level is we're so quick to tell people, kids what they're doing wrong. No, don't do that. No, don't do that. No, don't do this. Don't do It's like, how about we match the, the energy and the amount of words we use on telling kids what they're doing wrong, we match that with what they're doing right um, and positive affirmation, right? Like, dude, guys, that was awesome. Like, do we get as pumped up when a kid does something right as we get upset when they do something wrong? And I guarantee you uh, more people are getting upset and more people are, are pointing out negative things that are going on, which what kid wants to go through that as well, right? Like. So if I had to give any advice to a youth coach and if I was coaching my son's team and when I help out, it is all about how many positive things can I find and see and point out? Because the more that I point out those positive things, they're going to do them. And now you have a player that's going to play with with with, um, you know, hopefully loose and confident rather than, oh, man, what am I going to do wrong next? That coach is going to you know yell at me for and. How many times have I told you? And it's like, I, I've heard that before from a coach. Like, how many times have I told you you need to back up third? And it's like, well, I'm willing to tell you 150 times. Hey, man, you got to make sure you back up third. Hey, make sure you back up third. Make sure you back up third. I'm willing to tell a kid 100 times that that's what it takes. But if, if after three, four times I start getting frustrating, I'm yelling at a nine-year-old that you don't get it, you need to, you need to get, like, what, what am I teaching him? And now you have a scared player and he's just playing not to fail and probably he's gonna end up not liking the game and get out of the game when he's 15 because he's burned out. And at the end of the day, maybe you should look inward into terms of like, maybe I'm not saying it the right way or maybe I'm not communicating this to where he understands it enough that I've got to do something different to get through to him, right? And I think there's so much that coaches don't want to take on those challenges. And obviously at lower levels, like, I get it. There's a lot of, you know, dads and things like that. I just mean, even when you get into higher levels and it's the idea of like, don't you want to challenge? Like, don't you like when I get kids that come in here and like, they kind of give me a little like side eye and like whatever. I'm not like, Oh, who, who's this kid? Like, I know what I'm doing. I'm like, all right, let's go. Cause a lot of them come in here coachable and that's great. I love the coachable ones, but for my own sanity, I need some challenges at times too. And when you get the kids that challenge you a little bit and you got to figure out, all right, what am I going to get to figure out this kid, how he ticks? You know, what what am I going to do to, to get through kind of explaining things? They understand it. And I think that challenge is so lost. It's more of a totalitarian, you know, authoritative thing. This is what we do. This is how we do it. But nobody parents that way, right? I mean, yeah. like, you don't, like, you don't parent your two kids the same. They're mm -hmm. different, right? Mm -hmm. So you have to speak to them differently, talk to them differently. And you just got to think of every kid the same. Yeah. And I, I think it's a good point where... We all love the coachable kid. I mean, that's that's the layup. Um, and the uncoachable kid, I think we default to just the negativity part of it and the negative side of it. And and because the kid may be coming off as negative and, and, and standoffish, now we become negative and standoffish as coaches, which um, usually is probably not going to accomplish much. And so um, I, I do think just getting back to finding positives. Um, when I see a kid like that and especially younger kids, I just assume that he's probably gets told by every coach what he's doing wrong. And so now every time you hear someone saying some, something about doing something different, he's just turned off. And so how can I find more things that he does right? Or how can I put him in a position of leadership? Like, Hey, I want you to run this drill for me. Show us how to do this. Like we're going to receive like this. Okay, cool. Like just give them opportunities to maybe, um, to shine. And I'm not by any means condoning, 
a kid coming in and being a brat, but, uh, you know, there are kids that are going to be easier to coach than others. But I guess my, my thing is like, how do we challenge our youth coaches to stay positive when, uh, we're playing a pretty negative game that has a lot of failure, uh, and understanding that it's a hard game. Um, and we have to be willing to remind kids over and over again. We talk about it, you know, at any level as a coach, you're a professional reminder as a parent, you're a professional reminder. Tell my wife that oh, that's what we are. All we do is remind, wash your dishes, <laughs> brush your teeth, <laughs> make your bed. Like, and, and for me, like how easy is it to make your bed every night day and how easy is it to brush your teeth? But they constantly have to be reminded. Now you're talking about backing up third on a ball to the gap or we're backing up whatever base, but like a ball to the gap, you need to go here and this guy needs to go there. And by the way, you're playing seven different positions today. So you need to know all seven positions, responsibilities. And now they do something wrong three times and they get yelled at. And it's like, the kid can't even brush his teeth every night without being told, like, <laughs> how do you expect them to know this? Like, and that to me is the beauty of the game, especially the younger levels, like youth of just like embracing that side of it, embracing the failure, like good. That's fine. The, the, the more that he fails and, and the more that the, the, your, your kid that you're coaching or your team, the, the more that they can fail, you're just getting closer to that, that success. And, and, and you have to see it that way. Otherwise, you're going to get frustrated quick, especially if you're coaching a 10-year-old team. As a parent, you are gifted so many life lessons through sport, mm -hmm. right? And you have all these parents that are trying to basically – avoid adversity like get in the way of adversity for their kids you know shun anybody that's going to tell them that they can't do this or anything like that and the reality is like just be on the other side it's going to happen let it happen and be thankful you know there's there's life lessons in everything but not like sport i mean yeah. not like sport right i mean like you are given every single day something that you can be teaching your kid off of mm -hmm. and we should just 100 percent be embracing that and just want to awesome dude Freaking over four four Ks. Let's go. Let's get to work, man. This is yeah. life, man. Because guess what? You know, shitty week at work. You know, gonna that's happen. gonna happen too, right? Yeah. We yeah. gotta figure out how to how to deal with that. Yeah. Um, it's interesting. Obviously, you coached a long time at Cal, um, and having been in the college game and now the pro game, and just now me being older and kind of seeing development a little differently. You know, are we lacking in skill development? Do you think at everything kind of below the professional level? No, I don't think so. I mean, as far as catching or is just in, in general? general. Um, no, I mean, I think right now there's there's more information out there than you could ever need. Um, and, and so the development is happening. Um, but I think it's just about understanding who you are as a player is is maybe lacking. So when I say that, what I mean is, you know, we hear it all the time. If you become your best hitting coach, and let's say you hit with me, I need you to become your best hitting coach, not me to have all the answers for you. So, right? Sorry. <laughs> uh, like, you need to become your best hitting coach. Um, and I think we lose that part of it of, of I, if I'm doing a good job as a coach, it's helping you understand yourself. It's helping you find the best version of yourself. And, the, and I say you, it's not about me finding the best version for you. Um, and the only way to get there is by trial and error. It is by failure. Um, I say it a lot in Santa Rosa, you know, I do some work with some guys and Casey Olenberger has a, this barn up there. And it's like. Looks so cool. I see it on Instagram. Yeah, it looks it's, sweet. It's, it's yeah. awesome. And, yeah. and there's there's three barns actually. Uh, but it's, it's great. But one of my favorite lines to tell kids is, it's look, we're in a barn and it's. December 7th, what, why are you scared? Like, what, what would be wrong with failing right now? What would be wrong with doing a drill that's really hard? And let's let's hit this fastball machine, base, like hitting, right? And if you swing and miss, like, we're in a barn in December. Nobody cares. Like, let's swing and miss now to learn a lot about ourselves so that come season, maybe I'm swinging and missing less. And now I get that, that guy with a good heater, and I've learned how to – how to get the barrel there efficiently because I've gone through those failures and I force myself to train at a level that's going to have some failure. And th then you have a coach that's okay with the failure and, and embracing the failure and say, look, that's great. You're, you're getting closer to learning the correct way to do this. You're getting closer and better each time um, you do this rather than, nope, that's wrong. Do this better. Nope, nope. You need to, you know, get inside better, load early or do this. It's like, no, how about you just keep trying to hit it? And, and yes, there's going to be some things that we're going to talk about maybe, but like you can't 
skip the the training part of it and the learning from the training just because you know the answer for the kid like he has to go through that he has to go through swinging and missing like the first day at cal we got those machines right i mean pumping Mm -hmm. and every time you know the high, high school kid that came in and he's a top prospect and he, he raked all through high school and he gets in and he swings and misses at the first, you know, 10 sliders that he's facing. And they come out of the cage and they're looking at, at me or whoever and like, what do I got to do? And how many times do you hear the older uh, senior say, just keep getting back in the cage. Mm-hmm. Just keep getting back in the cage. And that's really the answer is, are, you know, we have so much information, but are we training ourselves to be the best version of ourselves? We may have the best information to help us become the best version of ourselves, but are we training in, as well at, at a high level? And I think a lot of us are scared to fail so much that when we do our training um, and, and uh, you know, someone's paying me money to, to help teach their kid, if, if, if they're failing, then maybe that means I'm a, sh- a shitty coach and that, that's not the case. It's from the, from the start, getting them to understand that, hey, failure is part of it and it's good because you're going to learn from it. And now they can kind of just kind of take a breath and be like, cool. Like, I don't have to worry about failing. Like, okay, you failed there. What happened? Man, I got way over the top of that pitch and I could really feel it. Like, okay, cool. Now, what can you do differently? And get them talking and get them to understand. But if without that failure, maybe that learning doesn't happen. And so if we make everything so easy on them and they don't, they don't have that adversity, how are they going to learn about themselves and how are they going to improve? And that's what we talk about. Some days it's like, hey, you know, little velocity we're gonna throw a freaking cutter out here we're gonna do all this stuff to challenge you guys and honestly you know if they're not failing you know at some point we're not doing our job putting mm-hmm. them in those uncomfortable situations and preparing from that now being a a hitting coach at the highest level talk about you you're, you kind of talked about that and you've talked about this for elite problem solver right that yeah. idea of like put them in a situation and kind of help them you know help them but but they're got to go figure it out a little bit now you're in season, right? And you've done all the training to kind of prep them to be ready for the season. You know, how much of it goes to, you know, putting them in those situations at times? Is it, you know, does it get to mechanics? Is it get to feel good, mental confidence? Um, obviously every guy's different, but in the season, do you, do you shut down a lot of the, the kind of overtraining? I, I don't know if shut down is the best way to put it. I think the day has a, a cadence to it and a, and a, um, progression i should say where um you know if if i'm thinking about what my body's doing while i'm trying to perform a very hard task it it makes it almost more difficult um so just identifying okay like we're on a tee at 1 30 in the afternoon for a seven o'clock game like if you want to think a little bit about your mechanics and you want to talk about it maybe you're not feeling right like let's go for it and let's understand that that's at 1 30 and two o'clock in the day and as our day progresses and we we're playing that night we're in the lineup like I can't, we, we probably don't want to be thinking about, you know, sliding my elbow as I'm in the, uh, the, the on deck circle. And so being okay with, okay, this is our time to talk about, uh, internal thoughts, right? What's my elbow doing? What are my hands doing? What's my load doing? You know, am I getting into my back hip? Whatever it is, that's fine. But then understanding as the day progresses, uh, we're, we're trying to get into compete mode and whatever you have that day, you better go out there and compete with it. And if you're worried about what you're doing and you're thinking about how you're going to swing, you're probably going to fail. And so as the day progresses, can we design things that are going to help them get mentally into that state of going and competing? Because regardless of what work you did all day, when you step in that batter's box, you got what you got. And can you get in there and compete with a good plan and commit to a plan uh, that's going to be give you the best chance for success, knowing that you're probably going to fail? Like that's that's the key. But a lot of guys that you know almost every one of our players when they're playing that night before the game they will do something challenging um you know whether it's velo uh a breaking ball they're going to do something that's pretty challenging to get them ready for what they're about to go do now hitting off a tee maybe for two o'clock right and then as the day progresses, you have bp and then after bp pre-game now we're hey let's ramp up this velo let's hit some velo for you know five ten minutes and now okay go out let's go let's go compete um and and i think when your day is designed that way you you mentally and physically are preparing yourself for what you're about to go do and so when you're one o'clock to two o'clock yeah let's talk about your technique if you want to you know are are we are we 
are you in here at one o'clock to just kind of get loose or are you in here because you're kind of scrambling and you need some answers? And that's okay if you need some answers. Let's do that now. But when we get to game time, you've got to be able to separate that and get yourself external and focus on a plan that's going to work for you. Um, but as far as the training goes, there's still challenging training going on. Um, and typically it's right before the game. It's like calibrating, if you will, before you go out to, to, to see what you're about to see is kind of the goal. So let's transition that to catching. Um, what do you catchers do pregame to kind of get to that same field? Does their day, you know, obviously they have to hit too, but does they their day involve more catching throughout that? Or is it just kind of the pregame routine of getting their body loose and having some feels and things like that? Mostly the pregame routine yeah. um, is, is what gets them uh, ready for the game. And uh, for some guys, it's different. I mean, they're, they're, they want to have a lot of velo. If they're catching, you know, Luis Castillo, they may want a sinker. Um, but but it's, it's one of those things that they have to kind of figure out what's going to prepare them to play. Um, and then you also have that typically they're warming up their pitcher in the bullpen too. Like that is as game like as it can prop, you know, or close to game like as it's going to get anyway. And so they're essentially doing what the hitters are doing, right? They they do their pregame work, uh, you know, whether it's plyo balls and a machine work and some blocking, whatever it is. And then they go and they they warm up their pitcher. That's kind of like okay, now I'm getting ready to go uh, and calibrating myself for what I'm about to go do. Um, and so it's a little bit different. I wouldn't say it is as uh, there's not as many reps as a hitter might take, um, but it's definitely like along the same lines of okay, let me get myself prepared for these movements, and then now I'm kept warm my pitcher up, and maybe I did some some machine work, but I'm now warming my pitcher up, and now okay, let's go play. Love it. This is the stuff. That, you know, it's funny you came on here and you probably thought, oh man, we're just gonna nerd out on catching, but this is the stuff that I really want guys to hear. Right? Is is you know the the stuff ever the day to day the preparation and things like that, that I think, you know, again, from a youth athlete just watching TV, they only see, you know, the good or the bad happening in the game. They don't see the rest of it. And I think just understanding process is, is super important. So everything was freaking awesome today. I always end one last question. It can be in Seattle. It can be on the road. It could be back when you were coordinator in minor league spots, whatever. You gotta give me one place to eat that pops out to you. Well, I really like Shake Shack, and I that's kind of <laughs> wow. You're going basic. <laughs> yeah, it's very basic. Uh, I'm pretty basic. We got one here now. Uh, oh, really? In Walnut Creek. Yeah. Oh, okay. Well, so I mean, and that's you know, people always say, "Do you like it better in in an outburger?" And I'm like, "Absolutely." You can get bacon. Um, but that's, that's you got to be careful saying stuff like that in California, man. These I, people are crazy I, about their in and out here. Crazy. I mean, the lines to get in, it's it's insane. Um, and it's really not that good. It's very good. Yeah. It's not waiting 25 freaking cars good. No. No. Not at all. Yeah. And, and it's honestly, it's quicker if you just park and go in than the drive through line, which I don't understand why people don't under, get it yet. But, um, uh, you know, it's funny. I'm not like a, a huge foodie. So when we go to places, I'm not looking to like really go out and I eat at the clubhouses a lot. So uh, <laughs> I will say Yankee Stadium's clubhouse has <laughs> the, the best food probably in the league, uh, just as far as like options and quality. Like it's it's unbelievable. And I mean, it's it's the big league. So everywhere you go, the food is re really pretty good. Um, so we don't get to eat out much, you know, you're at the stadium so much and so late too. Yeah. yeah. So you get there, you know, in the morning, work out and, and you eat lunch there and, and you maybe have a little snack before the game and then the game ends and whatever they got for post game, that's what you got. I, I I'll tell you, Houston has good bar barbecue post game a lot. Uh, you know, uh, Texas is the same. They have good food, uh, but, uh, the Yankees, uh, post game spread was, Something that uh, elite. It, it was elite. elite. Yeah, it's uh, you, you, if you go out of there unsatisfied, there's something wrong with you. Freaking awesome. Well, thanks so much for being on, man. I think everybody's gonna take a ton out of this and uh, look forward to seeing how you guys do this year. Thanks, Brad. Always fun to be uh, on and catch up. If you enjoyed that, be sure to like and subscribe. We'll have a new episode for you every single Tuesday here on our YouTube channel and wherever you listen to podcasts.